afternoon and welcome to the dedication and grand opening of the Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center here in Elijah P. Lovejoy Memorial Library of Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. I'm Regina McBride, Dean of Library and Information Services and your hostess this evening. I'm delighted that you're able to be with us as we celebrate this wonderful, tremendous event. I do want to recognize a few dignitaries that are here with us. If you would hold your applause until I have the opportunity to uh, get you know all the names. Um, first, I'd like to uh, recognize Philip Lachenay, who is this evening representing the Honorable Rod Rodney Davis, United States Congressman representing the 13th District of Illinois. Also, I'd like to recognize Honorable Milton Morton, judge of the 20th Judicial Circuit of Illinois, retired. And I believe the mayor is here from East St. Louis. I'm not sure. She indicated she was coming. Wonderful. So we want to recognize Amika Jackson Hicks, mayor of East St. Louis, Illinois. We also have a few academic dignitaries I'd like to call your attention to. First of all, we have a member from the SIUE Board of Trustees, Dr. Shirley Portwood. She is an emerita faculty from SIUE. She currently serves as a chair of the board's Academic Matters Committee and members of the Board of Architecture and Design and Audit Committees. I'm surprised she has time to be here. She also serves as the board's representative to the Board of Directors Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville Foundation and the Board of Directors of Alumni Association of Southern Illinois Edwardsville. We're very pleased to have her with us. Secondly, I'd like to recognize interim chancellor, Dr. Stephen Hansen. He is an emeriti faculty member from SIUE. He is a historian, author of books, journals, and highly regarded as an authority on the Civil War. But we'll, we'll get more about him a little later. Um, Next, we have a Provost, Dr. Parvi Sansari. He's the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor here at SIUE. Um, last but not least of the Vice Chancellors, Ms. Rachel Stack, Vice Chancellor for University Advancement and CEO for the SIUE Foundation. We have with us as well a couple of the deans. We have um, Jerry Weinberg, he's the Associate Provost for Research and Dean of the Graduate School. We have Kurt Locks, Dean of the School of Education, Health, and Human Behavior. And we also have Greg Busman, he is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So thank you all. We are here tonight to honor Dr. Redmond with the creation of the Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center. As you know, Dr. Redmond is a man who has devoted his life to opening people's minds, to helping them, to helping them realize their potential. Through thought and written word, Dr. Redmond has touched many lives and left quite uh, a, lot, a number of people who have served and been with him in his classes. The Learning Center will not only serve as a legacy to his achievements, but will also continue to accomplish goals for future generations. Dr. Redmond, along with his longtime friend, Dr. Maya Angelo, so elegantly expressed the desire for a room where students of all ages could gather and learn about Dr. Redmond's poetry, the black arts movement, 
African American history and culture. That journey began here several years ago, but brings us to this happy event. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Learning Center. The Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center is comprised of three rooms. First is the reading room, where scholars can utilize and examine primary source documents from Dr. Redmond's collection, as well as other parts of the special collections of the library. It will provide unprecedented access to unique materials housed in Lovejoy Library's special collection. The reading room will display many pieces of Dr. Redmond's collection and highlight his accomplishments. The displays will rotate on a regular basis to keep the material fresh for students and faculty who use the center. Second, the Learning Center contains a workroom where our special collections can be pro properly processed and digitized. Digitizing the content of these unique collections will allow access to scholars worldwide via the internet. It has long been a goal of the library to digitize our holdings for the world to see. And Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center will help make that happen. The final room in the Learning Center is the teaching room. It has 24 computers, a smart board, a state-of-the-art digital podium, and that will provide the ability to teach about our special collections including the poetic style of Dr. Redmond. This technology-rich environment provides limitless opportunities and possibilities for interactive discourse and learning. From our own students at SIUE to local grade school and high school students, this room will provide a tremendous learning environment and allow us to bring this collection to life for years to come. The Learning Center has been a dream for the library for quite some time, and thanks to many generous supporters, some of whom are here tonight, it is a reality. But much work remains to be done. Dr. Redmond has donated over 355 large boxes of materials. <laughs> they get larger every time I look at them. And most of these have yet to be organized and digitized and are made available to people all over the world. But that is our, our fervent hope. Which brings me to the last piece of the Learning Center. That piece will be a plaque that will be added in the coming weeks. It will contain the names of all the donors that made this Learning Center possible including Dr. Maya Angelou, Amira Baraka, Nikki Giovanni, Tony Morrison, Marie Evans, Loretta Dumas, and Tavis Smiley. We want to give all of you the opportunity to join us in this adventure and be part of making these collections digitized and available. Anyone who makes a gift tonight in the amount of $50 or more to support the Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center will have his or her name added to the plaque. Please see Erica Vandiver, and where is Erica? There's Erica. <laughs> um, if you would like to make a gift and have your name added to show your support for this amazing academic endeavor. Those of you who have contributed previously to the room and so forth will, will be included on the plaque. Uh, but you'd still have an opportunity this evening. I have three additional people I'd like to recognize before we move to the next part of the program. First is Dr. Howard Ramsey II, Associate Professor in English Language and Literature here at SIUE. Dr. Ramsey has worked tirelessly with Dr. Redmond in curating and displaying photographs posters, manuscripts for the Redmond Collection. He's also provided considerable consultation to us in the library as we organize and create digital collections. His assistance has been invaluable. Second, I'd like to recognize Julie Hansen. She is a Emerita faculty member from Library and Information Services. 
She served for many years as the humanities librarian and provided leadership, knowledge, and at times comfort as we moved through the process of developing these collections in the room. With her husband, Stephen, they developed a vision for what a contribution this collection would be for scholars from local through international. They convinced the university upper administration that we must do all we could to make this happen. They wrote grants, held numerous meetings, and provided staff to help. These two individuals, along with Dr. Redman, made this learning center a reality. Without them, we would not be here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Hansen, Interim Chancellor for SIUE. Before accepting the interim chancellor position, he was interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and then he was the real dean for the <laughs> graduate school and associate provost for research. Please welcome Dr. Hansen. Thank you, Regina, for those, those very kind words. I, um, I think there were many of us work very hard on creating the, uh, the EBR collection and in supporting the, the Learning Center. Um, and, and many of you are, are here tonight, so I, I don't, I feel somewhat embarrassed to, to get all the, uh, the praise that I don't think that, that Julie and I alone deserve. But we're here tonight uh, to celebrate the opening of the Eugene B. Redmond Learning Center. And the creation of this center is a singular honor and, and tribute to the art and genius of Eugene B. Redmond. Um, as Maya Angelou wrote, he is one of America's greatest love poets. He's a preacher of poetic rhythm, syntax, and content. The opening of this center is also a tribute to us, the community in which we exist. And let me explain what I mean a little bit by that. The collection, as Dean McBride has indicated, is extensive. Um, it's well over 100,000 items of visual images, flyers, programs, sound recordings, manuscripts, correspondence, many other kinds of, of artifacts. And all of it documents the activity of the African American liter literary and cultural figures of the mid-1960s to the present. What's special about it is that Gene Redman is himself an active participant in the black arts movement and offers, therefore, a very unique perspective to scholars, to students, to the community. He's a witness to the African-American literary and cultural movement of the latter part of the 20th century. Gee, Gene, that makes you sound really old. <laughs> But being a witness to, to the 20th century African-American culture is, is really, I think, pretty special. But in a larger sense, this learning center is a testament to our community. It reflects who we are. It reflects our own humanity. And by community, I mean it reflects our values, our customs, our habits, our beliefs. And some of the things that we believe in clearly are learning, diversity, pluralism, freedom, and absolutely art. As Amira Baraka said, art is whatever makes you feel proud to be a human. And I think the EBR collection and the Learning Center makes us proud, makes us proud to be human and be proud to be part of this community. It preserves something for the future, and that's very important. It preserves for the future our values. It preserves for the future a sense of our community, what it stands for, this rich mosaic of people and culture. And it preserves our community just like Eugene B. Redmond himself. It's one of poetic rhythm, syntax, and art. And that is what makes us proud. And it calls to the better angels of our nature. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Hansen. Dr. Redmond is a true Renaissance man. He is teacher, poet, writer of books, articles, and a scholar. He is a literary historian, capturing societal events with words and through the lens of his camera. He is a photographer extraordinaire. He is one of the greatest post-civil rights figures 
and has recorded, codified, and explained a tremendous repository of information and events that is the envy of many libraries. He is the Poet Laureate of East St. Louis, and he is with hundreds, literally, of amusing stories that he gladly shares with us. We've been pleased to work with him and got to know him and his collection, and I give you Dr. Eugene B. Rudman. Thank you uh, to um, Dr. McBride and all the other administrators and staffs of the library, the, certainly the, the, the regions of this university. I see, <coughs> excuse me, I see one of the members over here, um, high school classmates. Class of 57, there are quite a few of them here. Delta grade, all of the people, there must be about 40 people in the room who worked with me personally um, on the collection at my home in one of the five storages that I rent near my house um, at SIU East St. Louis here on campus when they were students of mine. In fact, they're students uh, of mine who go back to the 1960s, Sherman Fowler, <clears throat> from whom I learned as much as he did in my classes. I am going to read a pastiche of poetry. <clears throat> They weave in and out of two poems, one of them dedicated to my parents, John Henry and Emma Jean Hutchinson Redmond. The other one dedicated to Miles Davis, uh, and the poem was read in its entirety <clears throat> at Miles's memorial. in September of 1991 at his and my alma mater, Lincoln High School. Long distance warriors, dreamers, and rhymers. Oh, classical mamas and papas, solar-centered lovers, and parents of drum, scripture, and pyramid, Nile cool, and Benin blue songe fires, hip and pre-hip hop, diasporan daddies, and honey in the rock divas, ship huddle, and cattle hurried across an Ethiopian ocean. Oh, parents, fine brown ox, war poised and prayerful. Long distance dreamers and W.E.B.'s soldiers smelting ancestral ore into double conscious rhymes of epic passage, epic pain, epic spillage. Milestone, the birth of an ancestor, dressed up in pain, the flatted fifth began his funereal climb up the tribal stairwell. 
grief radiant as it bows and gleamed with moans spread like laughter <laughs> or Ethiopia's wings mourned its own percussive rise became blues born in the horse, East St. Louis air. Bore witness to the roaring calm, the garrulous silence, the caskets of tears, the gushing stillness, the death of the cool, became the birth of an ancestor. Yeah, y'all, the birth of the cool begat the birth, the death of the cool begat the birth of an ancestor. Oh, parents of memoirs and love mergers, ritual clickings, storefront saviors, cornbread fantasies, ham bone and banjo, railroad and gumbo, third goods, lesions, kings, cadres of orators, oh, epic parents of mother shore and father o'er, smelting generations of fine brown art into battles and prayer. Warriors, dreamers, and rhymers. <clears throat> there, there are a lot of Redmonds in the house tonight, and to my right is one of them. Uh, brilliance would be an understatement. Uh, as young as he is, <laughs> a great nephew, my big brother's grandson, his young charges at East St. Louis Senior High School have for several years been selected as one of the top high school jazz bands in the world. <clears throat> and consequently and subsequently appeared on the Today Show, played at uh, that famous Lincoln Center, you know, went and and all those people. And, and got to, <clears throat> excuse me, and played before an incredible jazz peer audience. I'm talking about the greatest jazz musicians that we have heard them, heard these children under this young man. So, uh, music is, it runs in the, in the blood, uh, like literature. Um, my family has always subscribed to Ralph Ellison's Moray. Eating is as important. Back up. Reading is as important as eating. I have <clears throat> some work to do. I need to salute some people. And so I'll be coming back and forth. It's not going to take all night. But I see two people who have worked with me around the table uh, on my personal archives or, or memorabilia. And they are Vivian Green and Ethel Graves. So I wanted to salute them. <clears throat> uh, 
Elva Graves is with the famed uh, Westbrook Green Community Choir, which was started in 1974, and uh, which um, just thrills, edifies our community during two concerts, one in December and one in June. And if you ever heard or felt your soul turn over, catch your Westbrook Green Community Choir concert. There are so many things to say about the collection, <clears throat> which ultimately will contain about 500,000 items. One of the things that the collection is known for and, and our community is known for is, a, um, is a, an original form of poetry called the Kwanisaba. And it is a, a form of sevens, a poem of sevens. It is seven lines. Each line contains seven words. No word can have more than seven letters. So 49 words. Uh, it has been written all over the world in Australia, uh, Iceland, Nigeria, the, the contest. And there are ma several masters of the form in the room. And so the first person who is going to, thank you, daughter. Um, the first person coming up to read a Kwanisaba is Charlotte Lumpkin, <clears throat> whose nom de plume is Molly Newman, um, a prize-winning playwright, a gifted thinker, poet, um, fiction writer, uh, Charlotte Lumpkin. Well, Doc, it has been realized. In Red's room, our words have sacred space, honed in a hub of his solar system, native to the eminent mounds of Cahokia, where truth seekers amble between Angelo and Duma, or lean fervid against Davis and Dunham. Touch Baldwin, read Morrison, hear Baraka, see right. From Lovejoy, one can reach Arkansippi. Roscoe Crenshaw is a jazz critic and aficionado um, and photographer, a deep, deep thinker, he holds a degree in English from the uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis. His work has appeared in Downbeat, The Post Dispatch, The East St. Louis Monitor, The St. Louis American, and you name it. Uh, another member of the club, Roscoe Ross Quinshell. Mind share. Redmond's right field temple, the cage designed edifice of global end sight, aloft so many artifacts, barred from East Boogie birthmite, rage wrapped in foresight, spine for high text seekers, bringing tangent rhythms, flavors, choices, voices. Solar dramatize offered to showcase that minds matter. <clears throat> Jay Willis uh, is, a, is a profound thinker. Um, she was one of the members of the Writers Club that traveled to New York and Dr. McBride was there also for the fundraiser 
that Maya Angelou gave on behalf of the of the center. Um, and she, she's smart. She's writing a book about Reginald Petty, an East St. Louisan who spent 14 years in Africa as director of the Peace Corps. Uh, so she's been interviewing him. That's just one of the many things she does. So, Jay Willis. This poem is entitled, Illusion Transfusion. The doctor divines dormant minds from diluted history to digest reality, lost on hungry eyes, and just his time capsule of photos and prose. This prophet sees great nests for legions of nomadic souls seeking ascetic love, transfusing nourish meant to sustain, trusting will feel our pate. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll be uh, interspers interspersing some acknowledgments. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's just so many people who've done done us well. Um, there are people that mentored me. And as I said earlier, some people in the room that I mentored. Um, I wanted to mention a Dr. Uh, William Mason, who had a, a very central role in the development of my career. I was teaching at California State University, Sacramento, in 1976, when the city brought me back home and named me Poet Laureate. Now, there are a lot of things that the city, East St. Louis, could have been doing. But it turns out that was a historic move. Um, the first municipality to appoint a poet laureate in American history. <clears throat> and it just, it just advanced my career. I mean, a lot of people have never heard of East St. Louis. They thought it was the east side of, uh, of St. Louis, like, uh, like, like commanders in the Marine Corps. They, they always thought I just, you know, lived in you know, some tiny section of, of St. Louis, Missouri. But they teased me about it. Uh, other people thought that I, I carried razors <laughs> and, um, you know, when you come from certain places, people, <laughs> they have a reputation, you know, Frank and Johnny. <laughs> um, but Dr. Mason was the mayor here in 1976. And I always put down, and it's my proudest achievement, outside of my family, my proudest single achievement. I mean, you know, name anything, but that's my, my proudest achievement. I always put it down on my CVs and resumes. People didn't know where it was, and what they heard about it usually was bad because, you know, cutting and shooting and the race riot. But it was impressive. He's poet laureate of a place. And uh, there were people who did know, who had some knowledge of it. But my, my point is that I had a title, and Dr. Mason gave me that title in 1976. And so he's in the room. We stand, uh, Bill. <clears throat> and it turned out just to be a very important thing because, you know, I had a title and it was connected to poetry. And I would come home uh, for reunions and weddings and funerals and, and, um, anniversaries, book parties, and um, people who didn't quite know what I did, they saw I drove a nice car and I could treat family to dinner and stuff like that. You know, help the nieces and nephews with school, you know, financially. And so people would say to me, 
Hey, Reg, you made that poetry thing work, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> um, Darlene Roy is president of this club and has been for 29 years. Her new book is called Afrosynthesis, and one of the things, A Feast of Poetry and Folklore, and one of the things our Writers Club is known for is the elegisms, which is creating words. Um, we're probably the best known club for that. I mean, Afrosynthesis. Um, we just create words, make words. Um, and um, so we're going to our 30th year, uh, Darlene Roy. It is so wonderful to see all of you here to honor Eugene. He's worked so hard and he really deserves it. The piece I'm reading is entitled Higher Realm, Scaling Danelli, his oeuvre, his oeuvre of work. We grasp inv invites to Maya's birthday feats hosted by Oprah. Maya's birthday feats hosted by Oprah. Yet, each plateau of galleys Morrison letters, African artifacts drew us to peaks at unique finds, to peaks at unique finds. Like drum voices, a critical history, a critical history. At Summit, we rested to bask in Eugenia's consciousness. You genius consciousness. Um, Eugene is the publisher of my latest volume of poetry, Afrosynthesis, A Feast of Poetry and Folklore. And I am presenting this copy um, to him. It was published by Black River Writers, a press that he started with his family in the 60s and 67. And um, I am an imprint of that. So my press is Akumba Scribes Press. So I am presenting to Eugene B. Redman to be included in his collection this issue of, of um, Afrosynthesis, a feast of poetry and folklore. Well, here we go again, Dr. McBride and company. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, again, I'm looking around. I see Lucius Jelly Jones, former student, uh, at one point served as um, confidant and bodyguard to Catherine Dunham. Minister Louis Farrakhan and sundry people. He was the one we sent to the um, airport to pick up Stokely Carmichael and Rap Brown <laughs> when they came into the city. So all of that's in the collection. Um, Chairman Fowler, whom I had the pleasure of meeting in 1967 and having him in my writing classes, again, is one of the uh, most profound thinkers that I know. He had a book called Imagineering, Juju, a collection of poetry. And he's, a, uh, he's an architect. Uh, an architect of thought, community uplift, and 
events. Uh, he drove in with his wife, I call her my sister-in-law, Harriet B. Fowler, uh, from Atlanta where he retired after spending a number of years as uh, the parent coordinator for East St. Louis schools. So bringing an original Kwansaba is Sherman L. Fowler. One of, the, one of the thing about these geniuses, Sherman is the only person I know who uh, holds uh, a degree conferred by an American and a foreign university, that SIUE and the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And he spent, with his wife, he spent uh, more than 10 years as his first a student then a professor, and then a businessman in Nigeria. Chairman Fowler. Good afternoon, everyone. It is customary to salute the ancestors, beginning with the oldest one that people call God, on down to the least of them. So we salute the ancestors on this day that our brother Eugene is being honored, accepted, and loved. This Kwansaba is for my friend and brother, Dr. Eugene B. Redmond, on this occasion. Bred to be a caged bird, forever roaming ghetto streets, Jean lift itself to grander worlds. New Jean, N-E-W Jean, humane, gabba dandy, dreams, Rising, rises with Maya, Margaret, Henry. Still rising, he builds future solar systems. Lifting young gabs with spoken, written verity, like love, joy, peace, loaded Kwanzaa nukes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at Charlotte Otley over here, an amazing woman from East St. Louis, whose story is in the collection. Everybody heard about Harlem's comeback. You know, Madison Johnson has a movie there, movie house. Even Red Lobster's in Harlem now. <laughs> um, she worked with Barbara Antier, another East St. Louisan, who built a $10 million National Black Theater and Communications Arts Center. If you go to New York, you've got to go and see that. And, uh, a few years before Ms. Dunham died, she named Charlotte as uh, the executor of her estate. She handled Ms. Dunham's affairs on more than one occasion over years, but from the point she was appointed to, um, to Ms. Dunham's passing. So I wanted to mention, I'm acknowledging people. <clears throat> a young woman I met 25 years ago at the National Black Arts Festival uh, is now, now holds a PhD, um, whose dis the dissertation for which was turned into a book 
on African-centered literary criticism. That's heavy stuff. African-centered literary criticism. Dr. Georgine Bess Montgomery. <clears throat> Professor of English at Clark Atlanta University. A man was in my workshop in the 70s, and we've been friends ever since. He's worked with me in Sacramento and the, the wider Northern California area. He's had workshops with me in Washington, D.C. Legally blind, he has achieved distinctions in three areas, poetry, playwriting, painting, Wait until you go in there. Charles Blackwell, Maine man. <clears throat> and the lovely MJ McWhorter. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're in from, uh, from the Bay Area and Sacramento. And MJ has her own company. Manufactures soap and then engraves it for hotels. You know, thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands of bars of soap with the hotel's name. Hey, that's all right. Charles Blackwell. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, this is really a very nice event. I'm, I'm very uh, honored and pleased to be here. And you know, when Eugene Redmond was in Sacramento, he would do this. He would, he would create this catalyst of bringing people together. And, and on, on the note of, uh, you know, to build up, to inspire, to encourage. And uh, sometimes it's hard to, for it to sink in to, to our heads since we come from, you know, whatever ghetto it is around this country, you know, at, at that time, you know. Uh, I don't know if y'all can relate to what I'm talking about, you know. But anyway, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's here today. And it's kind of funny how he, he can turn this thing around in such a manner. I said, to his, I, I said to Treasure, he was sitting way over here, I said, isn't he supposed to be up, up, up here, up here? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like there's a note of humility, there's a note of, uh, what do you call it? You know, you, you, you ain't trying to be this, the big cheese. But the bottom line is all of this that's given him to, today and all of you coming out and acknowledging him and this center, he, deser he deserves every bit of it. <laughs> and I say that, you know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? You know, people like him are far and few between. And, you know, after you've been around the block a bit dirt a few times, you begin to realize that they're far and few between, you know, and, you know, you really begin to appreciate and hope there was a whole lot more like him. Anyway, I'm going to go and do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> no, hold on, son. Okay. Here, y'all, here, y'all read it. <laughs> The E.B. Redmond Kwan Saba, standing on the shoulders of ancestors. Dirt, dust, history. From days of slaves. Lies and deceit, stripped by jewels of light. Seekers of truth born to inspire. Bigger be bitter, for this is love. Baraka 
Sonia, Eugene, Haki, just a few. Keepers of the culture, and we are too. Listen and stand with these bluesed black stones. <clears throat> when, you know, when you've known people for 40, 50, 60, 70 years, um, uh, James Rosser, who re just re retired as president of California State University at Los Angeles, and I met in the third grade in 1947. My mother died and moved to another community and, uh, and met him. And so we've been friends for um, uh, with, uh, 68 years. Uh, so all this. We are running, we do have to do the ribbon cutting and the tour, but I wanted uh, the man that I'm closest to in the world, and actually he's a hero of mine, although he's uh, he, about 15 years younger than I am, my nephew. Um, and when he was a teenager, he helped found uh, the publishing company, Black River Writers. Which his, aunt, which his auntie and my little sister ran while I was running around the world. So Donahue Redmond, <clears throat> while um, he and his wife, Judy, returned from Denmark not too long ago. And you can see Donnie, but he was director of the Nordic market for AT&T. So uh, how far we've come, how far we've come. Donahue Redmond, <laughs> former All-American. Good evening. You know, it's all too often that we come out and we celebrate folks when they get to culminate their career, so to speak, but we really don't understand. And a lot of us may not have an appreciation for the path that he took to get there. Now, as he said, Eugene said earlier, a lot of his rel relatives are here, a lot of Redmonds are in the house. And I'm speaking on behalf of all of them because any one of us that are here have our own personal stories about Eugene and how he impacted us individually which is an awesome kind of thing. Um, myself, I, I, I saw when I was in college, and I never had any idea it would ever culminate to this, but when I was in college at one point, and I was in an English class, and we had to write a story about who was a hero to us, who do we look up to, who was a role model. And in that class, I wrote about Eugene because my father had told me about him and what he did as a youth and how he then went into the Marines. And my brother and I learned how he, I mean, he had a passion for what he does, what he did, what he's culminating into. His passion began way back then when, and if you can imagine someone that's a youngster, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, going into a club and having the audacity to get up and read poetry <laughs> in a nightclub. <laughs> you know, not thinking in terms of what his peers would say. He forsook all that, it didn't bother him. He knew what it was that he wanted to do. And he went on a lifelong journey doing it. And each one of us, his relatives, appreciate him for everything that he poured into us because he is an educator. I mean, you have no idea what him being an educator means. It means that he comes and picks you up on a Saturday and takes you somewhere to, you know, just ride around with him. And all the while, he's educating you. And it doesn't matter if you get sleepy and you begin to doze off, he's still educating you. <laughs> he's just an educator. Probably each one of us has had a turn 
at him developing us in ways that we didn't realize. Even to the point of when he was at EHE, Experiment in Higher Education, going down to his office. And Eugene hasn't changed. If you guys have been by his house, you see all the books and writings and papers everywhere. Or his office was the same way. And he would have me to file it. I hated it. <laughs> But he would pay us, but I would get a chance as, as I was filing to read some things. And so all those things poured things into me as he poured into my cousins, my brothers, my sisters, all of us. So our appreciation for Eugene is well beyond this, which he has so rightly deserved. I I Iyanla Van Sant has a TV show on. And, uh, Iyanla fixed my life or something like that. And in this show, one of the things that she does when she's talking with the person who wants her to fix their lives is, are you willing to do the work that it takes? So when I look back at Eugene, starting at Pudges, having us to go out and sell beacons, which some of, beacon newspapers, which some of you have never heard about, you know, even from then, up into all the steps he's taken to Oberlin College in Sacramento and everywhere else, and he's still a world traveler, still on the go, you know, all I can think of is that he was willing to do the work, and this is the culmination of the work that he's done. So to applaud him again. Appearance on campus back in February was snowed out. He flew in uh, this morning. His novel, Americus, is set in East St. Louis. So you have to buy it. You must buy it. Um, Malik Ahmed, who is a CEO, founder with his wife, a better family life, and don't let that rather mundane title fool you. This is not an Ozzy and Harriet show. <laughs> um, I'm on the board, and we went from something like 250. This is a black a black organization, black community organization. Went from about 250 thousand a year to near 14 million, the budget. And all kinds of programs, from put down the gun, how you get a market, how you apply for a job, health and marriage, just some of everything. And this great man is here with his beautiful wife, dancer, teacher, um, Malik Ahmed. I know that we could listen to this for the rest of the evening, but it's time now for the ribbon cutting. So if we'll all kind of move back, uh, we'll get on with that ceremony. This way, Red. you can move in a little. Yeah, can do Cozy, cozy there. Look at him. Nice smiles, everybody. There you go. Oh, you can't open it now. 